Welcome to the next installment of the Gaming University Community Center. Today we're going to be joined by Matt from Hidden Machine. Their channel covers discussions for Remedy Games, Resident Evil, and many, many other of your favorite video games. I'll place a link to their channel page in the description box below. Today, Matt and I are sitting down to discuss Remedy's most recent release, Crossfire X. Pull up a seat and let's go. Alrighty, so this one, since I know you played this one right upon release, it took me a month to get to it, unfortunately, but Crossfire X. Yes. Newest Remedy game. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, so I, the biggest thing that I was looking at before it came out was, is it going to have anything Remedy related? Yeah, I was, I was like scanning the trailer really hard. <laughs> like, and it's funny because when I was watching the trailer, the only thing that stuck out to me was like, oh, that guy's helmet has a upside down black pyramid on it, which was completely pointless. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> was completely fucking irrelevant at that point. But the biggest thing that after playing it now, um, probably three times at this point, that I don't know if you watched the video I put up on my first impressions, but there was a lot of Norse mythology in it, weirdly enough, even though it was kind of hard to see. Yeah. So I, I didn't totally pick up on as much of it as you pointed out, but uh, there is a lot of it there. Yeah. It was nuts. Like, I, I, I probably took me half an hour to even recognize the name of the country as being phonetically similar to Asgardia or Asgard. Yeah, I, that totally went over my head. But uh, it was, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you'll get into it, but it was interesting to see that uh, given some of the Easter eggs that were featured in the game. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I just finally listened to um, Sam Lake's audio or a commentator track for the remaster of Alan Wake. Literally yesterday mm -hmm. has him talking about how much of that culture goes into it, which we already knew, honestly, just by playing the games. But it's nice to know that they very intentionally do it at this point. Yeah. Okay. So, but the biggest ones, I'll just kind of repeat was on that video for the time being. But the biggest ones I noticed is the entire point of Catalyst is one, seeing the future. But it's very much similar to mm -hmm. Odin trying to get information about Ragnarok and how to prevent or avoid it at the end of the day. Because that was the root of all of his need to gain knowledge, is trying to avoid his own death. Right. And that's essentially what we're looking at here between the two factions. Um, one question I had, though, the reason why Blacklist got started in looking for the Catalyst in the first place is because some contacts, quote-unquote, approached Fontaine and told her, hey, you need to go get this running to avoid a conflict. Right. But the game never really explains who the hell these people are. No, and, you know, I I can only speculate about it, obviously, but it's not uncommon in all of the Remedy games for there to be a sort of, like, shadowy, uh, you know, sort of, like, shadow government almost type entity uh, working behind the scenes. And even in something like... Uh, the Agents of Storm, like the uh, the iOS game they did, like almost ten years ago now. There's like a there's like a leader figure, who the the face model is Sam Lake. It's the Max mm -hmm. Payne face, but it's all cast in shadow, and you can't really see it. And the idea of like there being these sort of like organizations, whether it's uh, you know the FBC or uh, Acer or the Inner Circle. Uh, I imagine that somewhere in the writing there is something in the Crossfire X universe that's akin to those organizations. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. Unfortunately, I am almost not at all familiar with anything in the Crossfire universe as a whole. But actually, I need to talk to you more about maybe um, not on here about uh, that Storm iOS game because I've never played it and I didn't even know about it until watching your um, video on it. Well, it's unavailable. I oh, there, There's a bunch of gameplay footage, but you can't play it. Which just sucks, because with people like us, where we try to dissect literally everything that these uh, this company's ever created, not being able to get one chapter of it's frustrating. Yeah, especially because, you know, there is clearly some little nods going on throughout the game. It, it's like, if there's some... Is there more? There, there usually is. Do you think they'll ever come back to that? Maybe not like bring that game back specifically, but reference some stuff that some ideas they had from that. Even the idea of I know that the Crossfire X isn't really their idea, but it, it felt very similar in a lot of ways. The idea of these like the group, you know, like the sort of like military group. Uh, 
It's very similar, mm -hmm. and I, I do wonder if uh, maybe in some of the upcoming multiplayer games they're working on, if there will be some illusion there, you know, how I, I can't I can't be sure how blatant they would be about it because it doesn't seem like the game was a huge success, and it was only online I think for like three mm -hmm. years before they took the servers down, and it seemed like it was like a real like really? transitionary period for the company where they weren't really sure where they wanted to focus. Sure, what things. they were doing. Yeah. Mm, that gotcha. Like it'd just be really cool to take a look at it. I mean, there are some. What's the word I'm looking for? Opportunities to draw upon stuff, either from that or from Crossfire X moving forward. Oh, yeah. One example that I noticed, and this may just be me reading into things, which is kind of my shtick, to be honest, <laughs> but um, them calling the entire uh, Global Risk team as Vanguard Squad, when the term Vanguard is very, very relevant throughout uh, Control specifically. Yeah, that had to be intentional. Like, ju even if it wasn't going to be a lore intentional, just enough to make us go, oh, 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 what's going on over there? Yeah. Just to perk us up. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that was one of the first things I heard in the in the game. I think they only mentioned it, like, once, but it it stuck with me. <laughs> exactly, because um, for any of those who aren't familiar with it, so Vanguard, there's two references in Control about it. The first is there is one door in the Ocean View Motel that in the game code is labeled as Vanguard. But the symbol from that door actually appears in a document during the AWE DLC in referencing the Keystone AWE, where the entire population just up and vanished out of nowhere, and that symbol was painted on the walls when that happened. Now, normally when we have a everyone vanished, my question is, well, where did they go? Yeah. Like, I, I can't imagine they just dis disappeared from existence. So I've always been curious if, like, Project Vanguard or any reference to it has to do with pulling them from that control universe and moving them somewhere else where those people that's those citizenry would appear in another story later down the line right and so vanguard is also the at least the project name for one of their upcoming multiplayer games and I, I believe it's not the one that's directly related to control not the PV one. Yeah. Isn't that Condor, right? Right. I think the PV one's Condor, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, on the Remedy website, they they are listing, you know, basically, you know, job hires for the Vanguard team. Uh, and so it's unclear to me at this point if, if Vanguard is, like, the project name or the division that's working on those types of games or if it is the name of the game itself. I think both. And if so, like, is it going to connect in this roundabout way to you know, the various references to Vanguard we've seen thus far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, I just really want to see that plot go somewhere. Control set up so much. I know this, this uh, podcast isn't about control, but we kind of have to talk about everything at this point in the game. The point of control is it set up so many plot threads that were never pulled on that they probably have 20 game story ideas ready to go just by filling in the blanks of that one game. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, it's absolutely nuts. But um, the other interesting thing I noticed that tied into the more specifically the Norse mythology aspect is the operation itself for, during the first campaign of Catalyst was um, entitled, was it Operation First Frost? Which, again, mm -hmm. is going to be a reference to Fimblewinter, mm -hmm. which is referenced throughout all of Remedy 2. I mean, Max Payne, you had the three days of winter. Um, the whole idea is you have the one death followed by three years of winter before Ragnarok occurs. So if this event, this conflict throughout Catalyst is classified as the first frost, it starts the first three years before Ragnarok, a.k.a. the final conflict seen in Catalyst, is supposed to happen. Whether that's three years, months, weeks, it doesn't really matter. Just the concept of three. Right. Yeah, that <laughs> that that was something that also went over my head until you pointed it out in the video, and I was like, oh, man. Like, even in, uh, you know, a four-hire kind of abbreviated story like this uh it's still extremely rich it like, really way is. more than i expected like my, my biggest frustration because again let, let's let be honest the game's by no means perfect it's no. uh, i don't think it's up to the same quality as the uh, previous remedy titles that being said i think the biggest issue is one pacing but two the world felt bigger than the story if that makes sense yeah uh that was kind of like my you know, immediate takeaway when I finished the game was like, oh, that they ended it. And I have a lot of questions and, and felt like there was a lot of things started that they did address some of the things that they opened up at the beginning of the game. But I even the way they resolved things just left me with more questions. 
Mm -hmm. It felt like you're going out to a fine meal and you have the appetizer, then get up and go home. Yeah. That's what the game felt like at the end of the day for me. Yeah, especially the second campaign where, you know, you know, you're the whole thing is focused around this like cataclysmic event and and everyone is is freaking out and people are putting their lives on the line for it and then it happens and in even in the uh sort of like I don't think it's actually a post credit scene but in the post, you know, narrative scene, the sort of epilogue scene uh it's just even more confusing. It feels like they really rushed the the very end of the game where the ghost finally appears and, you know, I feel like I'm talking about the thing. If people don't really know what's going on, it's <laughs> I'm sure you'll be introduced to it at some point. But uh, mm -hmm. it, it yeah, it just it, it felt it felt like I kind of got the rug pulled out from under me a little bit. And I, I didn't really understand how we got there so quickly and why, like what any of it meant and where does it go? It, it really seemed like there has to be uh, maybe additional DLC coming to it at some point, or mm -hmm. the game was severely edited. Like, I, I, I can't imagine that this was the final form of this idea and it wasn't somehow taken apart at some point in development, you know? Understood. It, it, I think you, like, the idea I have is there might be a DLC campaigns or some form of continuation. Mostly because you showed me that uh, video, the trailer or launch video that came out the same day that had scenes that we didn't see whatsoever that wasn't in the right. game. Right. Yeah, there there was a a pretty, you know, I think it's a few minutes long, a, a cinematic trailer that showed a sort of peace treaty between the two groups, between the um, the two factions. And there's a lot of focus on characters that don't seem to appear in the game. Now, I'm not sure if they're characters that are available in the multiplayer. Um, I've only played a little bit of the multiplayer, and honestly, the only character that I see is this um, gal that runs, like, the weapon shop. Okay. And I don't think she's actually in the campaign either. Okay, that, that was my so. impression as well. So, yeah, it just, there was, I mean, it's very odd <laughs> that it wasn't addressed directly, but all the official social channels for the game shared this trailer that has... Uh, on launch day, I, I could see it being like a, a pre-launch trailer or, you know, a teaser from several years ago because the game was in development for like six or seven years. Yeah. Uh, but no, it was released on launch day and it's and it puts so much focus on this narrative and these characters that we don't see at all. It seems it's either a gaffe or something else is coming and, it, and <laughs> we don't know. Yeah, and just that by itself makes me... It feels like something else is coming. It might just be a hope, personally. But there's one of the... Um, like, even when you pull up the game and you look at the wallpaper for the one of the screens, mm -hmm. there's only really one character we know, and that's Logan. The rest of them are just random, we-never-met-them characters. Right. So it seems weird that they went out of their way to model and create all these characters, and they never appear once. Yeah. Well, if they're on the... Um... Crossfire X Wiki, there's like a bunch of characters listed beyond Logan. There's uh, oh, really? there's Knox, yeah, there's Knox, Marcus, Ruben, Lucas, Sid, and Ricky, and they're all like, they all look even more like Metal Gear Solid type characters. <laughs> gotcha. Um, but they're all modeled and named, and I don't really remember. See, I uh, maybe this is just my own ignorance. Um, no, maybe I don't they recognize were, those like, names whatsoever either. Yeah, they. I, I think they're all related to the multiplayer, but I didn't see them. Maybe they were, uh, you know, locked at some point because the game kind of had a rocky launch. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it wasn't like, I, I don't know, the people. There, it wasn't available through Game Pass when it should have been, and then people couldn't get it for days. And uh, even just recently, like I, I, I picked it up, you know, preparing for this and played through some of it again. And uh, there was a huge update patch uh, on the campaigns as well as the uh, multiplayer. Okay. So I'm wondering if these were like maybe um, unlockables that they that they maybe have given out since because it, it does say that all characters are now free to use. But uh, the, the other thing about this is that I don't think any of these characters are the ones from the trailer. So it, it does just further complicate things where it's like, okay, well, they made all this stuff. <laughs> Where yeah, is they, it? You kind of have to use it at some form. And 
the other thing that I wanted to point out about that uh, launch day trailer was I did okay so backtracking I, I did a little bit of research into the crossfire lore before this game came out and you can definitely see where remedy is pulling from the existing lore a little bit one of yeah. which which uh, we talked about briefly yesterday was the uh, monsters that show up in the um, one of the scenes that uh, Rob sent over to um, Finley but and those are supposed to be from the mutation mode correct yeah, and, and mutation mode is essentially uh, both of the factions are working together to fight these mutants, and the mutation can kind of spread to other people like a virus, and they become mutated as well. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, so, that's pretty much it. Gotcha, because like the impression I got from reading the wiki briefly, and again, I not, did not know Crossfire existed until last year when it, I saw Remy's name attached to it, was that... Over the course of trying to prepare for this, we're just going to call it the Ragnarok event in Crossfire. Let's just make it easy. Mm -hmm. That both factions, Gold Brisk and Black Watch, started developing technology at an increasingly rapid rate. So that when we did get to that conflict period, they would have the proper weapons to deal with it. Now, one of those weapons, from my understanding, is that monster mutation infection. And unfortunately, it got get out of control and just started spreading outside of their ability to contain it anymore. And once it went worldwide, they're like, oh fuck, okay, well put Ragnarok on hold, we gotta deal with this. Let's get over our shit and deal with this problem. It, now, I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. uh, in one of the flashback scenes or visions, I shouldn't say flashback because it's the future. Future events, um, yeah. Yeah, but in, in these scenes, there's one where it looks as if... Uh, all these like glass pods have been broken open. There's like green mm -hmm. goop on the floor. Is that where those mutants were held and they broke out? It wasn't really clear to me. Like I'm guessing that's the situation here because I in the multiplayer, the quote unquote zombie mode, they don't look like that. But it seems like it's basically the same thing. The second you get attacked by one of those creatures in the uh, multiplayer, you turn into one of them and now you're a zombie for the rest of the game. I see. Until all the survivors are killed. So it feels like that's what they were going for with that game mode, but they don't physically look anything like the monsters we see in this in the uh, uh, future vision. Which is, again, like, there's just so much confusion about what they're trying to set up here, and I'm hoping they're setting something up rather than just saying, yep, that's it. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like, like it, it's difficult to have the conversation because there's not enough information. We... Like, it feels like this game was season two of a three-season show. Yeah. If that makes sense. There's totally. so much before, and there's so much that's supposed to come after, and we're just thrown in the middle with no knowledge of what's happening. Yeah, and it, it, it's disappointing because it, you know, I the game didn't perform very well uh, initially, mm -hmm. and it, it's frustrating because it, it's, you know, if anyone doesn't know, it, it is, I, I think, the most played multiplayer game outside of the u.s well cross worldwide fire. yeah um it's just in in the states it, it didn't really catch on um like, i think it's like are we talking about the crossfire games themselves yeah or crossfire no just just crossfire itself like the original og crossfire yeah uh it's it's a huge global success that didn't really catch on over here and then as development was going on with Crossfire X, you know, people started talking about it more. I saw a bunch of YouTubers kind of picking it up and going, hey, did you know there's a game that's super popular that you probably don't play? And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people playing it were like, oh, it's kind of just like uh, like CSGO or something. It's like, it's it seems dated and a little janky. And I'm like, it is. It It's not like, yeah. it's not a super polished game. It's just fun. It's simple and fun and it can run on almost any computer. And so yep. taking that sort of like what's essentially like a budget game and trying to do a console exclusive version of it, uh, you know, we're For FPS Western games, audiences. you know, yeah, it's <laughs> like, you know, most most people aren't playing. I shouldn't say most people aren't, but I know a lot of people do not like to play FPS games uh, on a console, like especially competitively. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it's 100%. like it's a hard sell. And so, like, I, I do kind of worry that maybe there was a lot more, and I'm not sure if the response to the game is going to warrant uh, continued resources putting into it, being put into it to, uh, you know, continue to support and distribute whatever else could have been there. Mm -hmm. 
And, yeah, and that's yeah. that's the biggest thing here too. Because yeah, because there was a very lukewarm response. I'm not sure if it's the game itself or we are so used to FPSs and competitive shooters in general that are like top of the tier next gen technology in terms of mechanics, everything, that this felt like a little bit of a downgrade in comparison. Yeah. Like we're spoiled for the genre. Totally. And it like, you know, it I played it for a while, it's fine. <laughs> it's not but you know, I'm not really the audience for the uh online multiplayer stuff. Same here. Yeah, I, I frankly I haven't played an FPS since Halo three. <laughs> yeah. So like, it's just like, I, I just don't play, but it's not my forte, to be honest. But the story is really what I try to focus on at the end of the day. And I am lucky enough that I can ignore gameplay and focus just on that so that gameplay doesn't bother me in the slightest. Right. Which is a good thing. But um, let's get back to the story section of it and dive into the second campaign, which I personally believe Torres should have been the main character. And maybe we should have started with him before doing Catalyst. Well, I guess you have the option to do that, but I think he should have been the primary focus of the entire plotline. Yeah, in terms of writing, it would have made sense to introduce him a little earlier. Because for me, it's mostly, he is like us. He's thrown into the middle of something he has no knowledge of what's going on. So as a POV character, we would be able to empathize and be thrown into his shoes because he doesn't know what the fuck's going on, neither do we. Right, yeah, I felt the same way. Because, you know, especially if anyone hasn't played it, you start the second campaign... You go through a whole, you know, introductory section, and then <laughs> they introduce Torres, which is funny because, you know, you play through a whole campaign, you start another one, you think you know what's going on, they send you this curveball, uh, and it, it works. It, you know, it's it's a good character and everything, but it, I, I agree. They, they, he could have been the main focus first. Yeah, and we should start with him, and then maybe at little points throughout his story, they kind of, like, flash sideways to other parts of the uh, campaign where they're playing as Logan, where doing the catalyst stuff, and just, like, filling the gaps, but he's the primary focus, and everything else is tangential to it, I think would have been the best thing. But, yeah, so I think that would be the pr the best way, and he is the most Remedy character in the plot line, because Remedy has a habit of having characters that flirt with sanity mm -hmm. throughout their narratives. I mean, Max is like that, he obviously is messed up in the head. Alan, you think he might be hallucinating and have other mental issues. Jesse's borderline crazy throughout the whole thing. I think Jack's the only like, Remedy character that was relatively fine the entire time. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, he was, uh, if anything, just a little a little emotionally damaged and guarded, but... <laughs> that, he's he's very aggressive. He's yeah. a shoot-first type of personality, but that goes back to his childhood as, of being a... Uh, rambunctious kid let's leave it at that yeah <laughs> oh boy so yeah and the biggest thing with uh one question i had about torres and his decline was whether or not it had to do with the nanodyne specifically or the eoe or a psycho purely psychological thing yeah it seems like all of those elements are working together so the eoe i don't entirely understand how it works neither do we nobody um, does let's be honest <laughs> but it, it does seem like it was a mix of like to me it seemed like he just kind of like it, it basically it's accepted a fate that he was told he had to accept and once he did he just let go of you know free will essentially and let the the ghost in the EOE and that energy kind of take over him and guide him and, and turn him into something that he initially was really not wanting to be. But the other part of it that's kind of confusing to me that I don't feel like this was ever fully addressed outside of uh, documents, but it seems that Torres' mother was a, a blacklist agent as well, right? Actually, I think Torres' mother was a global risk agent. Because the whole plot line oh. with her was that she was dating, she married, or had a child with someone from Blacklist. And they were on opposite factions. So we've got a Romeo that and Juliet situation yes. here. So, like, I was always looking at Torres as, okay, well, you're the literal child of both factions. Right. In a literal and metaphorical sense. So that you could be the middle ground between the two, but it appears like he's going to become the primary antagonist that both sides are going to have to contend with from now on. Right. Okay. That that makes a little more sense to me. I feel like I must have missed some of the documents because I, I was going through that just kind of like 
not really understanding if that was going to be addressed again or resolved in any way, but it, I, I, they don't they don't speak on it, right? No, they never mentioned past that. All that um, the only information we get from her perspective is that the man that she had um, Luis with again was blacklist, and that he was devoted to their cause. And maybe this is just being me being weird, but I had some odd uh, tinfoil hat that maybe Logan was the father. Oh. Because remember, he did mention that he knew uh, Torres' mother. And yeah. gave her, gave him like very personal, like very specific personality traits of hers. Yeah. Hmm. Now, whether or not that's the case or not, it just like, I just got that weird hunch. You know what I mean? Right. Well, I guess either way, it, it just seemed like, that even like it was like his birthright to kind of become this thing that the two factions needed him to be. And it, it does seem like in some ways the, the factions, because, you know, when, when the game opens up, we just have these two giant factions. We don't know anything about them. Uh, at, you know, how it, it seems like they are, the public is aware of them. They're not like a lot of uh, private military corporations that kind of like, basically, you know, get contracted and work behind the scenes and, and they're not really household names. Um, it mm -hmm. seems like even in some of the newspapers and stuff, like people are aware of the PMCs and everything in this game. Uh, more, you know, akin to like a Metal Gear Solid type story uh, where it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing how these groups are affecting individuals. Um, it just seemed like he was kind of destined to be the thing that they needed to be because they kind of seem like in this story... They're destined to to just battle uh, until the end of, you know, reality, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, I, I don't even know what's causing the issues. Like, maybe it's in the main Crossfire games, but what's the beef here, to put it mildly? Uh, like, I've, I never understood that. Yeah, the only thing I've read is that, uh, you know, Blacklist is more uh, against uh, sort of like corporate globalization. Mm -hmm. And it seems like... Uh, the other team whose name is escaping me now. Global Risk. Global now, Risk, yeah. yeah. Global <laughs> Risk is... Coincidentally named. Uh, Global Risk is more kind of fighting for... Maybe fighting for government, uh, but, you know, government is so in bed with corporate interests that they're also kind of just corporate stooges going out and, you know, fighting terrorism in the name of uh, progress. Mm -hmm. And one thing I did note, um, you mentioned the newspapers. I did find one piece of world building that recontextualizes the whole uh, um, PMC situation. But in, apparently in this setting, there are countries do not have standing armies. And oh. All nations had to completely disarm themselves. And then they allowed these PMCs to take care of all of the uh, security worldwide. And that's the backdrop of this setting. And that was just a newspaper clip? Yeah, just a random newspaper I found somewhere in, I think, Act 1 of uh, the second campaign. Okay, yep, that is coming back to me. Um, yeah, and it, I, it, if I'm, am I, am I right? Is it just, you just have to look at that, right? It's not like an item you pick yeah. up and... Yeah, it's just, it's just a game asset. And there is so, like, I'm going to have to replay the whole game just to find every newspaper. Because if there is that much lore relevance in a newspaper, a readable asset that you just find in the world... I'm like, oh boy, here we go. You know, it's very, <laughs> I, it's very amusing that they would stick that much of the lore stuff uh, so deep in the background because I feel like they had to have known that people like us would be <laughs> um, scouring every bit of the game for that kind of thing. Uh, but it is a little disappointing that they weren't able to even just uh, say a sentence or two at the top of the game explaining what the hell is going on. <laughs> yeah, like give us like a Star Wars opening scroll or something. Just give us like a rough idea of what's happening. Yeah, because I mean, you you really, e even though you see a story from two sides, um, it's not even entirely clear to me how much time passes between the two campaigns. I, I, it doesn't seem like a lot of time, but Kavanaugh seems to be fully recovered after being, you know, seemingly on his deathbed with uh, having been hooked to yeah, the catalyst the machine one. and everything and uh, and then in the, in the beginning of the second campaign he's he's out on the field again I'd presume maybe a few weeks you know what I mean 
possibly yeah. a few week gap there, but they don't really tell us. And I think that's another issue, maybe not issue, but um, critique that I had is all the characters seem to have more knowledge than the players given access to. Yeah. So it's like, I understand having, uh, being thrown into the middle of things. That's why, again, I think Torres should have been the primary focus because he doesn't know what's going on either. But all these characters know things. We're not given privy to it. And we probably could have been if, one, the game was longer or they gave us... Like, I, Remedy doesn't do just exposition dumps right. willy-nilly. So they have to find a creative way to clue us in. And I guess a random newspaper is the closest they can give us. Yeah, it seems like they could have made an exception for such a short campaign. But I, I guess the other thing I was trying to get at with, you know, the, the two sides is they, they kind of marketed it as seeing two sides of the story. Um, but you're seeing part one of the story from one side and part two of the story from another side. And in both parts of the story, you don't really know what the other side is thinking or going through or... You know, it, it, you see it, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is like you would have expected the two perspectives to give you more information about what's going on, but because they're completely separated in time, uh, you, you don't really learn anything new from the other side about what the other side is doing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Because if we, let's just say if the uh, Spectre campaign took place right when Operation First First occurred, but from the other perspective of that same event, that would have been something versus these are two completely different situations and like and i found it interesting the method that they went around from the specter campaign to showcase global risk as a negative uh, pmc yeah is literally focusing on maddox who is a rogue faction <laughs> yeah so he doesn't even represent the the uh, global risk at all they flat told him uh this guy's crazy we need to get him out of a uh, position of power and then he just went rogue Mm -hmm. That doesn't say anything bad about Global Risk. It says something bad about maybe being able to handle this guy, but they try to get rid of him, and he it's implied he assassinated the freaking psychologist who wanted to kick him out. Right. Yeah, so I, it doesn't really do anything to, like, I don't know, to to make you sympathize with, with the Blacklist cause at all, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I just don't know. Like, I understand where they're going with it. I mean, like, the characters in Black, uh, the, uh, Blacklist... Our main uh, trio that we're working with Torres. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm good with them. But the leadership, mm -mm. right? Fontaine is kind of out of it, and that's why I'm. Let's go back a second. That's why I'm curious if the Nanodyne or the EOE or everything com combination is what caused Torres to flip, because Fontaine did take the Nanodyne too. It paralyzed her. Now I don't think her personality changed personally. No, she seems kind of the same person, so I don't think that's the issue. The EOE is really what I'm dialing in on for this. Because before he had that fused with the armor, he was Torres. After that fused with him, now he's somebody completely different. And it comes down to, what the hell is the EOE? Right, so the EOE is stored in <laughs> a giant tunnel with like a bunch of chambers all over the wall holding these EOE orbs. And he pulls one out, and it looks like a little orb of, like, it looks like the Hiss. Mm -hmm. It's just this red, you know, liquid sort of smoke ball thing. And and uh, <laughs> I don't it's, know. It does look like technology. No. Like, it doesn't it, look like legitimate human technology. Like, no, it I don't, looks where supernatural. It from? Like, either supernatural or extraterrestrial or something. Like, something's going on with this that they're not telling us. And I think the influence of whatever that supernatural slash extraterrestrial thing is is what led to his entire descent. Yeah, because it seems like it's sentient to a degree. It, it, at least in, in as much as it can influence and guide him because as soon as he takes it, he it like it literally bonds with his well it seems like it bonds with his armor. Yeah, the suit specifically, yeah. Uh which is like, you know, I mean it, <laughs> it makes me think of like Venom with the the uh right. the symbiote suits and uh you know, like the idea of an, uh, something external kind of making contact with the body and, and changing the personality. I mean, like, even something like the mask, you know, like that's right. that's not like a new idea. Like, that's playing on very old ideas. Um, it it's, it's something that's been explored in literature before, the idea of like, you know, fusing with an object and, and the object kind of taking over you. 
subsumes your personality. Yeah. Yeah, but it, is it is he possessed or is he is it more like a Polaris type thing where he's sort of like mentally sort of bonding with this thing because he he completely gives up his identity. Mm -hmm. And like I can understand um, just from a psychological aspect if it was like destroy it destroys his morality mm -hmm. which is why he went off the deep end but that would cause his identity his ego to be shifted right that would just mean like i don't give a shit and i'm gonna do what i want that could be done without him losing his sense of self yeah and it it kind of struck me that he was able to hold on to the eoe for a while before choosing to use it and it i do wonder if like it, it even like being near him being on his person uh you know was kind of drawing him toward that conclusion but also it seems like he was being uh very intentionally manipulated by fontaine by you know, everybody he, really but yeah. yeah yeah so he was there kind of under false pretenses because i think he you know he he was he was having everything kind of like uh presented to him one way and then in the end you know he decided to kind of go off the script and and try to help the uh, the rest of the blacklist members that he had gone in with and tried to rescue people and and you know he finally opened himself up to this familial bond that he was rejecting because he was you know because he'd been hurt before uh, mm -hmm. and as soon as he kind of accepted you know oh I do have a family like I I can I can accept love uh, is when he you know once that was fulfilled is when he also decided all right time to just die basically and. And, you know, Torres is gone now, and now I'm the ghost. Mm -hmm. It's like it coincides, like, I finally opened myself up to a allowing a family to come in, and they're immediately ripped away in one form or another. Yeah. Whether it's from betrayal or from death or what have you, it doesn't really matter. Which, that's like having a scar that's festered for your entire life, and then the second you rip it right back open, it gets infected again. Right. So it, it And seems it's just like... like ugh. So maybe that, like, that loss and, and just that sort of, you know, hyper-accelerated sort of being shoved into this situation, not knowing what's going on, being told your destiny, and then, you know, finally accepting these bonds and just as quickly having them torn away from you, it, it, I, I could see it putting him in, like, sort of a rock-bottom emotional state where he just said, ah, fuck it, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna become the fuck ghost. It. Yep, yep. Whether it's purely psychological or an outside influence from the EOE, doesn't matter. The end result is the same, I guess. But the interesting thing about the EOE to me as well is that it's in a blacklist facility, right? Was it black? I, th I thought I thought it was a global risk facility because that's where Maddox. Oh, was I'm at, sorry. Yes, were... it is a global risk facility. Yes, that's what I meant to say. Which means they're produ they're the ones producing it, right? And they never tell us well, how, where did you find it? How did you learn how to make this? What are you doing this for? It's again just there's so much. Like Remedy has a habit of leaving us off with cliffhangers. Let's be honest. Yeah. But they at least give us ninety five percent of the story. Right. This, it feels like we got 15% of the story. Now we're like, okay, what the fuck's happening? Right. So I'm, I'm curious how Global Risk was able to, you know, it. so Blacklist was working on the Catalyst and everything, and they had their own sort of, you know, dipping into what could be how, just all these, like, sort of paranatural, like, taboo scientific experiments. Mm -hmm. And Global Risk is like, oh, this is awful, this is awful. But then... Uh, if Global Risk thing. is doing the EOE stuff, <laughs> like we know the EOE experiments were also not great. Um, I think they do talk a little bit about like people being exposed to it. I don't know. I it's just like, it, it it's it's again it's like well, <laughs> Where, when's the sequel? Well, yeah. What are what? <laughs> who, how did they get it? Is it is it man made? Is it not? Uh, it, it seems it seems so out of this world. Uh, that yeah, it makes me like, wonder, like, what are Global Risk's, you know, greater connections to things that we never see? And, and that brings us back around to two um, unknown factions that I wanted to bring up. Actually, technically three, now that I think about it. One, let's go back to Fontaine's contacts. So their entire advertisement to her again was that by getting the Catalyst up and running, you'll avoid conflict. Now, we know this that because they got that information, it caused the conflict to escalate. Yeah. So obviously these people weren't trying to prevent it. They were trying to coerce 
Fontaine into pushing forward towards this Ragnarok scenario. And that begs the question, why would they want that? Who are they? Like, what's their end goal at the end of the day? Do they want global destruction? Who freaking knows? Uh, the second unknown faction that I noticed, which, well, isn't unknown, but technically this is just me being a control nerd, but Blacklist did mention that they respond to a board of directors. Yeah, now who these people are, who knows, but I just thought it was kind of amusing they only called them the board. Yeah, I, I, I picked up on that as well. <laughs> I'm like, okay, it's it's not going to be that board. Let's be 100% frank here. But um, uh, who knows? You got an inverted black pyramid on the, the ghost's helmet. So who I mean, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think more specifically where they were, like at least how I choose to interpret it, is that the board, the pyramid itself in control is kind of like the archetypal symbol of that concept of having a board that governs those below it. And that can express itself in various forms. That can be a government agency. That can be the board of directives for um, Blacklist itself. It doesn't necessarily have to be the pyramid itself. Right. Kind of like how the telephone isn't the energy behind it for the hotline. Correct, yeah. If that yeah. makes sense. Totally. And that's just how I choose to interpret it. But the third thing that I noted was it was said that there were Ares mercenaries sighted in the country at the time. Yeah. We never get more information on what the hell that is. No, my, my immediate thought was, oh, is this another, you know, uh, group similar to Global Risk and, and Blacklist? Um, and, and I kept looking for other references to that because it seems, again, significant enough you're going to name these things like and mention them. It, it's not like Remedy to mention something really significant and not at least show in some way, you know, a way to to draw back to that. You know, if they set up something, there, there's going to be a payoff, even if it's very subtle. Um, you might need, you might need, you might see like the results of something and have missed like the setup in, in a Remedy game. Um, but, you know, upon replaying, you go, oh, wow, they, they introduced that earlier and I just didn't see it the first time. Um, yeah, so upon replay, about, yeah, we yeah. can say we got this. But yeah, the, I, I didn't see this again anywhere. And I, I'm just Googling it up on the wiki right now. So apparently Ares is the name of a male character in the original Crossfire. And he was intended to be the normal version of the hero in hero mode and the mutant escape mode. Oh, wow. So it's the name of an individual, not necessarily an organization. But in Crossfire X, they reference it as an its own military organization. So I'm curious if maybe the character Ares went on to form their own PMC at some point. Yeah, that, I mean, that would make sense. Like, that's all I can really figure out. But yeah, I'm, so it's not unheard of within the lore. It's just, it's not what, it's person. It's not a thing itself, which is kind of weird. Right, and and to kind of just call back to what you were saying with uh, Fontaine's contacts, you know, instigating this whole situation, uh, I, I kind of, felt like maybe it was you know and and this is i'm reading way into this now but uh you know possibly a third sort of pmc like a more powerful one uh setting these other two against one another to create the you know the ghost situation uh to continue a perpetual war scenario that they could you know control and, and profit from mm-hmm which I mean, it, it it feels like that's again that feels a lot like a Metal Gear kind Solid like war, kind of thing, war profiteering situation. Yeah, but it's just like you know, if if you could create this like situation where the two of the largest PMCs are going at each other and and are, uh, you know, spawning this 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 force, this entity, like the ghost is supposed to be, you know, supposed to bring about like the greatest war of all, like that you know, it's just supposed to lay waste to everything. Um, it would it would give you a, a situation that you know you're creating the problem that you could be the solution to, mm -hmm. and maybe they would be in over their heads once they actually got there. But it does seem like somebody was trying to force Manipulate. this this situation to happen, and and you know why mm -hmm. else would they do it? So, just listening to you talk, I had a random tinfoil theory about the nature of this quote-unquote contacts that I wanted to run by you real quick. 
But before we discuss that, I want to go back in time to the 1970s when the initial scientists were working on the Catalyst program mm -hmm. in the cave to begin with, right? So do you remember if there was an explanation on what happened, what caught that caused them to cease the experiments and then close off the mine saying there's a leak or something? Do you remember what that was? I don't remember seeing anything specific. So yeah, I, I don't either. But the second bit of uh, data point I saw is after Blacklist was done with the Catalyst at the end of the first campaign, the machine just up and vanished. Mm -hmm. And they have no clue where the th hell it went. It's like, and they're like, this thing is huge. How could it just vanish with, as if nothing was there? So one, I'm curious if... Okay, this is a side thing, but I'm curious if Ares had something to do with that. Mm -hmm. But more specifically... I think this would be a better, narratively speaking, if the initial team in the 70s gained so much intelligence from Catalyst back then that they were able to foresee, like, thousands of years into the future, and then they ended up determining to become, like, the arbiters of fate, so to speak, that they, those original scientists and their lineage separated and started to manipulate the entire world from behind the scenes now that they knew exactly what would happen. Interesting. And they started creating things themselves, and then after... They told uh, Blacklist, hey, you go out there, do this. And then once they were done with it, they're like, okay, you don't get any more of that. That's ours now. And then they separated and removed it as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a similar thought in that, you know, the reason that maybe they stopped in the 70s was they saw, uh, you know, what continued use of the Catalyst would, would bring about with, with the ghost and, and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. But that doesn't really account for the Catalyst disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> again yeah it's like it just up and vanished and that takes resources the likes of which i don't think either faction could really pull that off no i mean it's like to be 100 percent frank I, we, we don't they don't really explain how the catalyst works but it's like it you know it's like a supercomputer type thing the size of a room it, it's it's mm -hmm. enormous uh for for it to even even to to simply move it would be a a, a huge undertaking and I don't even think anyone would want to try that because I'd probably break the damn thing. Yeah. So I don't. I don't know that. Uh, I I do like that theory a lot. I'm like it. Like for, if I was writing this story, that's how I would write it. Yeah. They they become the watchers. They'd be the watchers. They'd be the observers. They'd be uh, the adjustment bureau, so to speak. Yeah. If you're familiar with Philip K. Dick. But so those are the biggest things. And the this one's a little bit less, more on a shaky foundation. But I wonder if Ares mercenaries were contracted by them to help move it. Yeah. And that's why they were there. Again, that's based upon nothing but conjecture, but I think the first part of it sounds pretty decent, at least good literature at the very least. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it it makes as much sense as anything that actually happens in the game. <laughs> right? Um, so that's going to be that part of it. Let's sidetrack real quick and talk about the elephant in the room considering the announcement a couple days ago, Max Payne Connections. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I I could go on for hours on this one specifically, but the biggest thing for me is they were making this and probably made the assets for that room while they were still talking to Rockstar about getting this Max Payne deal. Yeah. And they likely knew something was coming down the pipeline, so they chose to throw this, throw this in there in preparation for something. That's exactly what I think. I, I, I mean, there, there was uh, like three months apart, basically between the launch of the game and this and uh yeah and they've been working on this one for what six seven years yeah. they've probably been talking to rockstar for at least two or three yeah so it, it it was so you pointed this out to me i missed this uh easter egg on my first playthrough and when i finally went back in and saw it i was just like oh my god this is <laughs> i yeah because i commented to you um but i told you it was like hey so there's a the most overt Remedy Easter egg is over here. And you're just like, well, there's a lot of good stuff in Spectre. I'm like, no, 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 trust me. This is the most overt one right here. <laughs> Crazy. So, I mean, well, one, the, uh, I, I, I would love to see if on the PC, uh, there's sort of like a, um, you know, like a architectural kind of like level design thing going on. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see if that could eventually be identified, if that was something that, you know, is is maybe even related to the Max Payne remake, um, which is, it seems like it wouldn't be, you know, at this point in development. But uh, having basically, you know, the sort of like desperate ramblings of 
it's all connected. Is it all connected? Uh, you know, just teasing the Remedy Connected Universe stuff so hard uh, in this game. They, they, they better deliver on that. They can't just be teasing us on that. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would hope so. I mean, obviously the connections <laughs> are, are there. Like, the game, uh, Crossfire X, prominently features bullet time. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think they call it bullet time. No, I forgot what they referred to it as. But, um... Okay. Sorry to sidetrack real quick, mm -hmm. but I was reading through a um, tinfoil hat theory on the... I'm not sure if it's the control of the... Al it might have been the Alan Wake Discord, but it doesn't... Or not Discord, but um, Reddit. Uh, subreddit. But there was a entire essay written about the nature of Valkyr. Okay, yeah. The drug itself. I don't know if you um, saw the post over on Reddit. Yes. But the basic idea was that they, the thing itself was actually either blood or genetic material from an extraterrestrial source that the, um, uh, what, what's the name of that network? Either still network or whatever it was. It was, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, ended up using that as the basis for developing that drug to create super soldiers. So they're basically doing like an X-Files style genetic uh, manipulation using extraterrestrial genetics. And that was the running hypothesis on that. Now, the thing is, Valkyr's green, obviously. Let's flash over to Crossfire X. Mm -hmm. The green <laughs> goo all over those pods. Yeah. See where I'm going with oh, that. Oh, totally. What if this is the original representation of that extraterrestrial species? That would be great. <laughs> like, that would be a perfect way to mix the two together. Now, granted, that whole thing with the alien blood and Max Payne, that's not confirmed at all. No. Whatsoever. But... If that's accurate, then linking it over to here would be a wonderful way to mix the two together. And I think it'd be really freaking cool if they say that Max Payne and Crossfire X, those share a universe, Alan Wake and Control share a universe, and we make our own Stephen King-style multiverse, where some stories are over here, some stories are over there. Yeah, it does seem like that is kind of what's happening um, to a degree. I mean, maybe not officially, but... It's very easy to read it that way, especially uh, because, and this is kind of jumping topic, but the blatant Quantum Break reference that happens right before the Max Payne reference in Crossfire X, uh, whereas, you know, Quantum Break takes place in this sort of like weird sort of separate universe that is connected in many ways to Alan Wake and Control but still doesn't seem to take place, you know, in that same universe. It is, there is a degree of separation there. And there's a little bit of echoes within it. And it's trying to figure out how they link is probably the biggest question for the Remedy community period is finding logical and not forced ways to connect all of our stories while understanding that these are not set place in the same universe. We already know that for a fact. Right, and I, I think that uh, in Control, you know, Dylan's quote about the different universes existing, you know, on top of each other and side by side and, you know, sometimes crossing over and sometimes not. Like, he, he kind of explains that concept pretty explicitly. Mm -hmm. and, and I do believe I that's mean, like, a reference to how, how these stories work. Exactly. I mean, like, one simple way to think about it is there's technically two realities that you and I live in right now. The one that's actually physically happening, happening, and the one that we remember. Because mm -hmm. I can remember something from when I'm 10 years old that didn't necessarily happen. So therefore, we have two realities, my memory reality and then the real reality. Yeah. And you can make the argument that, hey, Max Payne and Alex Casey, they are not necessarily the same person, but they're connected in that very loose way. Yeah. If that makes sense. Totally. And so it seems like... There is, uh, especially in these sort of like auxiliary games, Crossfire X, Max Payne, Quantum Break, uh, all three are connected, basically. I mean, you have, you have an item from uh, Jack Joyce's world, from, uh, from I think it's from William Joyce's lab, is a, has appeared in the Crossfire X universe right next to someone else living in that same apartment building. Uh is aware of Max Payne and is aware of these connections, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. if you're reading it, you know, literally. Into it like yeah. that. Yeah, well, I do want to point out that we do see that giraffe in the um, the Vision uh, apartment, the ho the uh, house 
in the children's room as well. So we, there is other places we see that giraffe asset. Mm. But, um... um, Yeah, so, I mean, having all these, you know, the, the references to Norse mythology and everything and the bullet time and a lot of the themes, you know, walking through the dream worlds and everything, it, it all, like, all throughout, even the idea, which is in all of the Remedy games of, you know, um, this sort of, like, survivor's guilt tied to a family member, uh, all that is is very heavy in Crossfire X, but then to see literally the word pain written on the wall <laughs> to be like, hey, yeah, uh, we are doing this on purpose. <laughs> no, yeah, like, it's... There's no question about it at this point. Uh, two seconds. I'm going to bring up my screenshots mm -hmm. for that wall. Give me a second. All right. So I have a list of all the words that are written on that wall there. Mm -hmm. And one of them, obviously, painkillers. Obvious reference right there. They reference pain. Um, they call him the hermit. Mm -hmm. Secret identities, timelines. It's all connected. Uh, da -da 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 was the last one? The biggest one that it pointed out to me was captured by their identity. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out what that means. Again, this is probably just crazy conspiracy theorists like you and me talking about the game. So it might not all be meaningful, but yeah, the entire, like how I proceed. I don't know if you watched my uh, playthrough of it yeah, or not, but one hypothesis I had was that because anytime you change character perspectives, it looks like you're being subsumed into that mind. Like you're diving into them. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious if the archetypal idea of Max Payne is literally being sucked into each of their heads when you take control of them. Like, it's hard to explain the thought on it, but the style of shooter character, not Max Payne himself, but the archetype of it, if that makes sense. Right. I don't know. Like, I have no idea. It's like, it's it's hard to put into words. It It is. It is. Um... <sighs> Yeah, it, it's it's hard to say because that I think that part is also one of the ones that's kind of scratched out. Um, possibly. I think when it's it says, partially scratched out. Yeah, and so it's like I wasn't sure what that meant. If that was like, it is. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. It's like, is it? Is that is that a? <laughs> I, am I supposed to look harder at the things that are scratched out, or am I supposed to kind of disregard them? It, and you know, the the thing yeah. that you know, it's <sighs> there's a lot on here. There's a lot on here. The other thing that, that's there is is the eyes. There's like two drawings of, of these eyes, and there's also a drawing of the eyes on the desk behind this. Mm -hmm, and so when mm -hmm. it says like captured by their identity, it's like there is like a they. And and it also says that, you know, it says at the top, like he is watching. Yeah, he, him, I, I'm being watched, he is watching. So it's from the perspective of somebody who's writing this stuff on the wall. Now, this may just be as simple as this is a Remedy employee writing about us, the fan base, watching them. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but it's, I don't know. Like, the the first thought I had with the whole zooming into the people's faces thing was that's Kavanaugh being shifted around, and we're going from the perspective of the Catalyst. Mm -hmm. where he's visualizing this, so he sees it happening in the first place. I, I kind of felt that way, too, but I I, I felt like that was... It, I think it's that's more explicit, likely. You know, but it, it's, it does... It, it's Yeah, it's easy to read it that way. All right. So um, before we end this off, I did want one more little mini topic that is, if we do get more, a certain gameplay mechanic that if I was designing, I think would be really cool. I was talking to um, the Yellow Bat, from the uh, Discord about this last month. But the whole idea, the relationship between Hall and Kavanaugh mm -hmm. in that scene on the bridge where Kavanaugh literally grabs his hand and says, hey, by the way, you want to shoot that because if you don't, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. So imagine having, let's just say Kavanaugh's like the Polaris in this, in this scenario. Yeah. I'm giving you unconscious, intuitive, advanced knowledge about what's going to happen to this, so you can literally be a super soldier without any special abilities other than your in battle instincts are perfect because I'm telling you exactly what's going to happen. So you can, like, using in a chaotic sense, set the board so that all the dominoes fall exactly how it needs to be for you to always get through the situation. Now, what I thought would be cool considering that Kavanaugh's being, like, or Rob's shit, Hall is hallucinating him all throughout the game is if you had like, for example, Kavanaugh way off in the distance, 
like the little shimmer of him. And that is a cue to the player to go, hey, what's going on over there? And it's literally him guiding us into a secret area that gives us lore backgrounds or information background. But we use his the hallucinations as an actual gameplay mechanic to get through the environments. Yeah. Yeah, I cuz I, I I was I was actually looking for something like that after that scene happened. I was like, "Oh, is he going to like is he starting to like appear in my reality physically now?" Um, unfortunately, no, but <laughs> is it that one time? Like I mean, that one scene, they could have taken that and expanded the entire game centered around that one mechanic. Totally. Like, like if you're walking through an area and then a random thing off in the distance is shimmering, like, oh, I shoot that, it causes this. Or it's him guiding us to help us get through platforming sections. Or just something, you know what I mean? Using that, because like how Polaris does it in Control, where she points out certain things in the environment, says, hey, go over here, look at that. Totally. I mean, using that exact same concept, it would, one, be an echo of Control, but also really play into what's unique about Crossfire X. Yeah. Rather than treating it like a standard shooter, but that's that it really highlight the remedy part of it. I I, I have one more question for you. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have any insight or just thoughts at all on the final scene of the game where Torres uh, essentially clones himself, and I, you know, it <laughs> it it seems like a like a huge thing to end on. Yeah, like, it, again, it's it's Remby leaving us off on a cliffhanger, but this is such a big thing, we need to have more information on it. Now, my hypothesis is that after he was subsumed by the ghost, he just went off and started looking for all of super weapons mm -hmm. that Global Risk and Blacklist are developing in preparation for this Ragnarok-style conflict coming down the line after the Three Winters occurs. Yeah. But I'm curious... <sighs> I'm honestly curious. Okay, hold on. Sorry, I just had a thought off the top of my head. So we're calling him the ghost, yes? Yes. Now, is this Torres's ghost, or is it the ghost of someone else who's gone before him? Yeah. I'm thinking in the back of my head, the E... Okay, we don't know what the EOE is. What if Tinfoil Hat Theory, Dogen Pool, Tinfoil Hat, the EOE is literally the, res the remaining consciousness of the initial team, and they're literally plugging them in to take over to basically return them back because they no longer have physical form so it's literally the ghost of an old per an older person hmm yeah that has legs <laughs> and the second you like you make clones because then you literally plug different souls the eoes into it which each is basically creating a body for different people hmm i don't know there's maybe something i play too much kingdom hearts i play too much kingdom hearts so that might be have something to do with this but yeah, I, I could see that. I don't know. I, I was just so struck by that scene where I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> You're going to end me, end it there on me? Come on. It's like, <laughs> give me more. I think that's what sums up, just to bring the whole conversation to full circle. Crossfire X, in my opinion, is summed up by the world is bigger than the story and we need more story. Yeah, and I do think that even if we don't get any, it does really touch on the thing I like the most about Remedy Games, which is that it gives you enough to think about it and play with it in your head later. And just even just, you know, just theory crafting for the sake of fun, <laughs> you know, you're not necessarily working toward any great truth. It's just a fun thing to think about. And it's, it's rare mm -hmm. that works of, of fiction and, and video games, especially will give you that much to kind of just mull over and expand on. And, you know, it, it just, it continues the experience in a way. Yeah, because, like, I love those types of communities. I think that's partially why, um, not just Remedy, but I was, for almost, was it, two decades now, probably two decades now, I've been in the Kingdom Hearts community as well, is the community of talking to everybody and trying to figure things out and our discussions and the everything that's going around, that's 90% of the fun right there. Mm-hmm. And the new games come out, all they do is give us more information to theorycraft with. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's... The new game coming out is not the end-all, win-all of the entire experience. It's... The community is most of the experience yeah, itself. Yeah, you, you don't necessarily want the solution, you know? Because that, then it ends, and then you... You know, how many, how many great stories have you gone through that just... Well, you got the answer at the end, and that's it. And you forget about and that's it. That's done. You know? It, yeah, and sometimes, like, 
as long as they're self-contained stories, they can be great stories in their own right. But having always wondering about what's going on is just keeps us in that state of excitement. Yeah, for it's, what's it's coming fun. Up. It's secrets and mystery, and and that's that's just a very fun thing to play with. So, well, well, I exactly. do think the game has some flaws. Uh, it still gave me enough to think about, and and enough that I was interested and invested enough to, you know, to think about all these things we brought up. And, and honestly, there's a lot more that we didn't touch on that. I think if you play through the game yourself, it's like there there's a lot going on here and there are a lot of yeah, connections. I'm sure that even though I played through it a couple times, I think you have as well now. I I don't think I've can even pulled all the threads that are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I tried to hit the biggest notes in uh, the information I sent over to you so we can talk about it today. But that's probably only maybe 30 percent of what we have in there. Yeah. But I think these were the biggest and most important part. But um, so that's going to be it. I think we'll just conclude this saying that I fully anticipate future games uh, by Remedy, whether it be Condor, Vanguard, whatever, to possibly allude to this so that we we know that they're, it's not completely forgotten. And that's all I can hope for at the most right now. Ditto. Ditto there. But um, anyways, thank you so much for hanging out and chatting about this game hopefully we can bring some more notoriety to it and hopefully remedy realizes that we want more of this yeah totally but um yeah so um if there's anything uh, else you want to throw in here before we end off uh no uh check out hidden machine <laughs> over on youtube if you'd like uh there's a lot more stuff similar to this so uh, absolutely because you guys do full like three four hour discussions for these games to begin with and that's for yeah every well remedy game We'll have the whole team kind of play it. A lot of times it's some of us playing it again, some of us playing for the first time, but then we get together and just kind of bit by bit uh, break down the whole thing and discuss our experiences and theories. Perfect. I'll go ahead and link out uh, your channel here uh, um, in the end cards, and then I'll link out to... Do you have a specific video you want me to throw up? I think the uh, exploring the Remedy Connected Universe video is something that I think a lot of people would get a kick out of. Sure. Anyone who's uh, still with us, check the top right. You're going to have a card there that'll link you out to that video. It's going to be your uh, end all, beat all for everything you need to know about the Remedy Connected Universe right there. Cool. All righty. So thank you so much. And all right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, for joining Matt from Hidden Machine and myself in our discussion of Crossfire X and its potential connections to the RCU as a whole. If you would like to recommend any future content for the Community Corner, feel free to comment. I'll see you in the next one.